I guess we can just start a little bit. I, I won't like be starting. I, I hope still that some people will come 9.15. But uh, we, were, we wanted to kind of give you a little bit background introduction into why we're do, dealing with like these 3D brain atlases and what we're using them from and kind of our perspective on this. Um, so what we're aiming to do with the Human Brain Project, we're aiming to integrate heterogeneous neuroscience data into one platform and making it possible to find it, uh, find data and access it and have them quite interoperable um, to be able to use it together and analyze it further. In the data curation team, we receive a lot of different types, dis disparate like neuroscience data from data producers within the Human Brain Project, and we try to um, integrate it um, together, um, registering uh, similar metadata. And one of like the common denominators that we are very, yeah, uh, that we use um, is of course location brain, because all data sets often like have an association to a position within the brain, like very specific or maybe a little bit more broad. Um, and I guess this, this is kind of the main topic also for today, that we use position in the brain to think about and understand the brain. Um, yes. So um, I guess when, when you search for information online, um, what we have found is that research results can be very overwhelming um, and a little bit unstructured. Um, you can find articles, images, tables, diagrams, um, but they often have various use of nomenclature, formats, units. Yeah, so it, it can be a little bit difficult um, to understand how, how am I gonna like, build this into something I can make sense of and um, put beside. Um, and I guess this can feel like an overload, like both for experienced researchers and, and young res researchers, because it does take a lot of time to do like a thorough screening of all information available for the topic that you're interested in. Um, so this is definitely a, a challenge today. Um, and I guess on the on other hand, um, today um, only kind of a small portion of all research is available um, for the reader. So these are often interpretations of research results um, presented in, in scientific papers. Um, while the data that this is built on is sometimes um, on a dusty shelf somewhere and not uh, presented and we it's maybe lost which is a pity I think um, so currently you could almost say that links between researchers are, are a bit blocked um, there's like paywalls if you want to read an article sometimes you, you can't um, and there's also need to personally get in touch with each other to just to know if what another group or another researcher is doing is of interest to you. Um, and I guess this can be a bit frustrating um, because we want to be efficient and um, yeah, optimize like research. Um, and I guess this can actually slow down important research. Um, yes. So the data creation team, this is kind of the challenges that we're trying to tackle. Um, we're trying to make neuroscientific research data more discoverable, accessible, reusable um, to get the most out of research. That's kind of the big goal. Um, and we do this by curating all the data that we receive and that we want to make available to users. And creation is defined as the action or process of selecting, organizing, and looking after the items in a collection. 
And of course, in this um, um, context, a collection of neuroscientific data. Yes, so trying to integrate all of our data into a knowledge graph, uh, a graph system. Uh, we register metadata, um, so data about data, um, such as species or location in the brain, as I mentioned, um, and link a data set, a collection of data, to metadata categories, so that the data set can be queried and accessed and downloaded for further use around the world. And we strive to follow the FAIR principles, um, which you might have heard of before, I hope. Um, so the FAIR principles for data management and stewardship. And when we tag a data set with metadata, we make it findable. You can search for it in a search engine. Um, and we try to make our data accessible and downloadable via persistent identifiers um, and giving clear terms of use. Um, and by presenting uh, the data files in open formats, they can also be interoperable with tools and yeah, to open in different programs that you want to use them in. Um, and to integrate with other uh, data of similar formats. And I guess all of this, um, including like more detailed descriptions of methods uh, and materials, makes um, a data set more reproducible and reusable. So when data is created and made available for other researchers to use it, um, yeah, so the data creation uh, tries to create a research infrastructure so that we can connect different people in the field together, from students to professors, clinicians, um, modelers. Um, and I guess we, we want to uh, ultimately unleash the potential of all the scientific contributions that are delivered um, to our team. Um, and we want to um, yeah, help answer the big questions, of course, uh, about the brain and its diseases. Um, yes. So, um, we use location in the brain as kind of one of our main common denominators. And how do we do this? Um, so, I don't know if you can see this, but we receive together with the data set, we, we receive some information about where in the brain um, the data was from. Um, so we call this user-defined location documentation. And this can be um, terms and descriptions. Uh, for example, hippocampus, CA1. Maybe they uh, reference um, a reference atlas, maybe they don't. Um, they can also um, give us coordinates. This can be linked to a stereotactic brain atlas um, or um, a landmark such as Bregma or Lambda. Um, or it can be defined in a coordinate space um, that we can interpret and translate to the coordinate spaces that we are using. Or it could be in form of um, a brain section image where we can see where they took the sample or maybe the whole brain section image is actually the data. Maybe it's histology. Um, it could also be like a brain um, volume. Um, and we have several atlas integration procedures. So if we receive um, a term, we try to translate it as uh, good as we can to one of the atlases that we use um, in HPP. So we use um, Vaxon Space uh, Atlas of the Rat Brain, we use ALM, um, Mouse Brain Atlas, 
and we have several um, human brain atlases. I guess you will learn more about that. Um, uh, but what we're going to talk about um, today is the, um, the image registration. Um, so both 2D to 3D image registration, but also 3D to 3D image registration. And we have some tools and workflows, analysis, analytic workflows that um, also builds on this registration. Yes. Um, and when we have done what we have done, <laughs> we register the metadata and we integrate the location um, metadata, then um, we're able to um, present the data sets in our search engine. It's called the Knowledge Graph Search. You can find it from the Human Brain Project .eu website. Um, and we also have a brain viewer. And there you can also query a four data set um, from the viewer. So we will look a little bit more at this.